good evening, everybody. Grace Church, Wednesday night. I don't know about you, but anytime it rains in Amarillo, I'm thankful. Anybody else thankful when it rains in Amarillo? Too many times it's just way too dry, way too dry, but it's uh, raining, and uh, you, ne you never know what's going to happen when it rains, so... Um, I, I didn't know I was going to do this tonight, but I got to share with you something brand spanking new. It was about 10, 11 months ago that we started hearing from this guy in Tennessee, and uh, <clears throat> him and his wife didn't have a church at the time. They found us online. In case you don't know, there's so much going on online, it's crazy. So I'm glad, I, I preach to this audience here. I'm glad you guys, I'm glad I'm not alone. During COVID, there was a lot of sermons we did alone, preaching to a red light. Oh man, it was so bad. So I'm really glad you're here, but what you find, there's more people that'll watch this sermon online and then are in the room. A lot more. So there's like a growing audience out there. Now, you know this is where it's at, right? You know this is where it's at. And unless you're Zach and his wife in Knoxville, Tennessee. And so when they're watching online and tracking us Sundays and Wednesdays coming through most of this year, they wanted to be here. And... Then when the opportunity with radio opened up, and this guy's way too young, or maybe he's the perfect age of who you want to be in this church. He's either 24 or 25. He's got two little boys. Um, he's gonna have to leave on Friday to go get his wife, who's still in Tennessee, and drive back. But Zach, would you stand up? The latest guy on Radio by Grace is right there. <laughs> You can sit down, Zach. Way to go. <laughs> it's really hard to describe the Holy Spirit Amen. watching something, you know, on a computer and then wanting to be there. And a wife that worked at the sister plant of Pantex in Tennessee who quit her job and they sold their house and she's going to help raise their two boys so that Zach can work full time in radio. And so he's already working. He's got an office upstairs and he lives right around the corner from my house. You say, why are you telling us this? Because it's just weird in a great way. I remember when I was on sabbatical, I called him. And I was driving down to Knoxville in Tennessee, and we just talked. The first time we talked. Zach, are you glad you're here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll ask him the same question in a year. <laughs> but we, we really are. And I, I can't tell you all the stuff that's happening with radio. It, it, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Well, I'll give you a little hint. He's not the newest employee. And he's only been here a month. Have you been here a month yet? A week and a half. A week and a half. I take it back. <laughs> he's still not the newest employee. He's not. You want to hear something weirder than that? I, I mean, I knew, I knew about Zach. You know, he came to my house and we watched a football game just last week. Was that last week? And he's a Packer fan, by the way. It's another whole story. It's a whole story. It's a, it's okay. We have grace. We have grace. We, we have grace. But, but then, while we're already here and, and starting to sing, this young family walks in, and, and I've only met him one time, 
And believe it or not, I don't remember everyone, like obviously, I don't remember everyone when I meet them and you throw in three services and all the stuff that's happening here, but I knew I recognized this family. I just didn't remember from when. Well, it was recent. It was as recent as when we were tagging Israel. So I know it's since October 7th. And they walked in on a Wednesday night, and they're all excited, and they live, or they lived in Meadow, Texas, and they went to Ben Martinez's church. I remember talking to them, but then they moved here. I remember telling you, you ought to just move here. Well, they did. I don't even know their names, but they're sitting right there. You guys want to stand up for a second? I mean, just because this, you know, there they are right there. And they're living right next door to Zach. No, I, I don't know where you're living. <laughs> did, did radio play a part in this at all down there? Or really Ben Martinez and here and then here you are. And so make sure I tell this story correctly. So you have your own business, which you came here to Amarillo for business. Is that right? Is that accurate? Okay. But you also came to Amarillo for our church. Huh. That's that's pretty good, guys. So, not right now, but afterwards, I need you to tell me your name again, because <laughs> I don't remember from October sometime. You know, all that to say. I mean, I I know how to track. And we, we don't put it, at, you know, like we don't have goals. We don't have like, okay, here's all the visitors. But every, every week, if somebody fills out that visitor card and drops it off in the offering, or if they drop it in the bookstore, I, I, we do send them a letter. And so I, I do know, like, on average, who all is coming as visitors on average. And what was it? Where's Mike Kessel? Is Mike Kessel in the room? He's hiding on me somewhere. I believe what I'm saying is right. Sunday morning, second service, we had five different people stand up. I know we had five different people because we prayed for them today in our staff prayer meeting. I know we had five different people, but I believe all five were brand new visitors, second service on Sunday. So, anyways, it's rainy outside, so we're not going to have a sermon tonight. We're just going to hold hands. <laughs> And sing Kumbaya. By the way, I got all my eight kids up here. They just let me say this again. Let me say this again. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine. But what you can't see, I'll say this again, they have notebooks open. And they're drawing pictures of me right now. I mean, <laughs> they have their Bibles open, they have notebooks open. I don't know what you want in a church, but I've never seen, now consistently since we had church in the park, a whole row of kids in the front row, and I appreciate you have, but you're not a kid anymore. You, you guys moved here from Hereford, but you're not children. To me, you could be my children, but these guys could be your children kind of deal. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17. Well, I take it back. We're in Proverbs chapter 16. But in my Bible, I'm looking at chapter 17 because I want to start in verse 31. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 31. Hey, as long as I'm calling out people, can I don't even know if it's okay to call out other people <laughs> that you wouldn't know about. Patsy's in the room. Stephen's in the room. Her son got killed on a motorcycle. We did his funeral here. About 1,200 bikers. Stephen hasn't missed a service since. You bragging on Stephen? I'm bragging on Stephen. Because the only reason he's here is the word of God Amen. and Jesus. 
And I might be in trouble for calling him out, but that's okay. Because he gave me a hug right before I came up. <laughs> Stuff's happening in your church. And I'm just glad I'm old enough to see it. And you say, why? Well, that's the verse I want us to start. I told you last week, I did change the sermon title a little bit, but we tagged this verse last week, verse 31, chapter 16, Proverbs 16, 31. The silver-haired head, the silver-haired head is a crown of glory. So last week, I think I called it the silver-haired head, and I'm still grateful I have some hair left to be silver. But it's a crown of glory. Amen. So tonight I just want to tag the sermon crown of glory. It's a crown. It's not the crown of glory. That's another deal. But a silver-haired head is a crown of glory if. Can I hear you say if? Yeah. Just because you have gray hair doesn't mean you have the glory. But if you get old, and if it is found in the way of righteousness. Getting, hold, getting old with gray hair doesn't make you special. It just doesn't. It makes you old. <laughs> you, might, you might have wisdom, or you might still be the same fool you've always been. But the crown of glory is if it is found in the way of righteousness. Translated, if somebody's walked with Jesus in the way of Jesus and then's living the right kind of life in Jesus, you have the righteousness of Christ imputed to your account. It's not somebody just religious. It's not somebody just old. It's somebody that they came in contact with Jesus and then his righteousness was imputed to their account that's a technical thing. It's a, actually a banking term. They're declared righteous because of his righteousness, not because they went to church forever, not because they did Sunday school or even endured Wednesday night services. That's not it. They're following Jesus. They got saved by Jesus. Now they're following him. They've been in the way of righteousness. It was imputed to him, but now they're cooperating with it. They're walking in that righteousness. They're, they're listening to their Bible and all of a sudden, it's like they have a crown. Amen. They would have honor. Re remember that. Remember, because there is a crown. There are crowns that are received later. And it's going to be in the sermon. We, we actually cast our crowns, casting crowns. It was the name of a, a group. I guess it's still the name of a group, casting crowns, okay? That's actually in the book of Revelation. We're going to be there in a minute if you don't leave or fall asleep, okay? And you say, why are we going to be there? Well, because it was in the Bible reading today, and it tags in chapter 16. What are you saying? It's worth it. It's worth it when you're 15, 16, 17. Yes. It's worth it to know Jesus. Yes. And then when you guys are all old and gray, I'll be dead. Most of the people in this room will be dead. <laughs> but you will then have a life. See Joyce right over there with all the gray hair? See Joyce sitting right there? See Joyce? See? Okay. <laughs> She would be one in our church that has that gray hair on top of her head. That's a crown. Amen. You say, why do you say it's a crown? Well, because she's always happy. She cleans this church all week long, and then she comes to church, and she watches us get it all dirty again. And then <laughs> tomorrow she will clean. She has a crown. She knows Amen. Jesus. Her husband's already in heaven, and she's still following Jesus. And she loves hanging out with young people because it makes her feel young, but she's not young. <laughs> and neither am I. So it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it to follow Jesus. Yes, not just when you're old, when you're middle-aged, or when you're 24. I don't know how old you guys are, but glad you're here. It's worth it. Yes. Father, thank you for your word. We're just reminded that Religion cannot produce that. Self-righteousness cannot produce that. 
For sure, Lord, sin, sin cannot produce that. Only, only Jesus can produce in our lives before we even get to heaven some kind of crown of glory. It doesn't mean we're better than anybody else, but it does mean we've cooperated with your grace and your mercy. All of us in this room, we're still learning our lessons together, Lord. There's nobody perfect here. But many in this room have decided to follow Jesus. And their lives are changing. And in some in this room have done that for decades. And I could name others, Lord, they do have a crown of glory and gray hair. So I would thank you for Joyce's example to us, Lord. And all of us that know her know that it's true. And that that would be a, somehow a, a jealousy for everybody that's young. Not jealousy in a bad way, but just that we would pay attention. We don't have to be the same sorry thing we were when we met Jesus. So we thank you for salvation. We thank you for declared righteousness. We thank you for the positional sanctification that we already have. But I thank you also for the practical setting apart, day by day, sanctification, becoming more like Jesus as we listen to your word. I thank you for young families that are moving here, Lord. I thank you for salvations that are hearing your word. I thank you for, there's a lot of people in this room, I, they're new to me. And on a night where we could have stayed home, we're here. Thank you for all the ones on YouTube right now. For the ones on radio, Lord, what you're doing with your word, not because we figured out some kind of gimmick, what you're doing with your word and with your spirit and with people. And for nine kids that would sit here, Lord, week after week after week, would you bless them in a special way? We have no idea what it's like for them when they go to school, when they're hanging out with whoever, or somebody's after them. We pray for them, Lord. We pray for this example that they set before us. And any of us, Lord, that lost that eagerness, that hunger for your word, may they be, I pray, a holy jealousy for us. So just thank you tonight for Jesus. I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would bless us, special with just uh, application, and that this proverb, Lord, it's all over the board as far as proverbs go but that you would just uh, get the glory. And we could hear your word, heed your word, and leave this place better than when we came. Thank you for the rain. In the name of Jesus, and all God's people would say, Amen. hey, I'm gonna give you a break for just a second. Would you stand up and greet somebody around you? You got like 30, 45 seconds, and we'll get right to this. Okay, everybody. We are in Proverbs 16:16. 16, 16. Proverbs 16:16. 16, 16. Walking our way through Proverbs. Just one more little commercial for you. Um, you know, Christmas falls on different days, obviously, um, as years go by on, on different days. This year it was like, okay, Christmas is on a Monday, which means Christmas Eve is on a Sunday, which means it gets all messed up. It just does. I, I actually did some research. I, I checked with other churches I know and had Mary check around and stuff, and like, man, it's all over the board. So you can either do it like nothing special, or you can do it like special. And so after sitting and talking with our staff, and especially with John, okay, our worship leader, John, and we're going to have a choir and all those guys and stuff. And so I said, John, it's up to you. What would be best for your team and your choir? They, they, and they drive in. The furthest one's about an hour and a half from here. And uh, so we decided we're going to do the same Christmas Eve service Saturday at 6, Sunday morning at 9, Sunday morning at 11. So we have three Christmas Eve services. 
you're welcome to come to all three of them if you want. But you might want that nighttime feel, it's dark outside, Christmas Eve. Okay, that'll happen six o'clock on Saturday. That one's for you. And we're gonna have communion and like I said, a choir and a short sermon. But you say, no, 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 I wanna go to church on Sunday. Well, then you can come at nine or 11 and it's gonna be the same thing. Merry Christmas. We've already looked at the calendar next year. <laughs> and uh, it'll be back kind of to normal. Where, so anyways, I say that. And so you know what that means. <clears throat> Sunday is the only Sunday that I get to do a Christmas message on Sunday. And yet there will still be a sermonette on Christmas Eve. So this Sunday, I thought somebody would say amen. Okay, we say anyways. <laughs> And so I wanted to get Acts chapter 5 in the box. And so anyways, we're in Proverbs 16. And you say, why did you tell us that? I just thought you wanted to know. <laughs> Proverbs 16, we got to verse 16. Here's what it says. Proverbs 16, verse 16. How much better, how much better to get wisdom than money, than gold, than riches? You say, I don't know about that one. No, no, no. Listen, the Bible actually tells us how much better to get wisdom that's not just being smart. That's not just getting your college education. No, no, wisdom is that gift from God. Wisdom is that what to do in life, what to do with the word. Where, where do you want to live? What do you want to do? Wisdom, how to follow God, all those things. How much better to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding is to be chosen you would choose that rather than silver, rather than money. Wisdom with understanding. Yeah. Yeah. And every time I read that in Proverbs, I, I, I think of Job 28, 28. It's a key verse in your Bible. Book of Job, one of the greatest paragraph in the whole. How do you get wisdom? What does wisdom mean? Where can you find wisdom? And Job 28, 28 says this. And to man, to God, he said, God said, behold, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. The respect, the awesomeness, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Amen. You, you can say, well, I have respect for the Lord. I fear the Lord. He's awesome. But if you understand that, the fear of the Lord is wisdom. To depart from evil, you, you actually, your departing from evil is understanding. So when I, when I see this right here, um, okay, if you have wisdom, if you know wisdom, if you know the Lord Jesus, if you're coming with the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, that's better than gold to get understanding to depart from evil, according to Job 28. Well, that's even to be chosen rather than silver. Can I see James 1.5? James 1.5, real quick. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. And so you say, well, I, I don't know what to do. Well, you get to, James tells us you can ask for wisdom. Just ask for wisdom from God. You say, well, what's that going to look like? Well, you're going to receive information, you're gonna, but you're also going to depart from evil. And you say, well, how come you're saying that? Uh, the next verse. Verse 17, the highway of the upright, the highway of the righteous man, the highway, the highway, the life path of the ones that know Jesus is to depart from evil. He who keeps his way preserves his soul. If there's one thing you want to preserve, it's your soul. You want to pay attention to your soul. And the highway, this life, this road of the upright. And it's not like just the religious person. I'm not talking about Or the self-righteous. I'm not talking about it. I'm talking about a Christian, somebody that knows Jesus. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. See, on the side here, I wrote, there's a highway to hell. <laughs> <laughs> There is a highway to hell. You were on the highway to hell before you even got turned around by Jesus. So praise God you're not on the highway to hell. 
And so next to that, I said, well, there's a highway to heaven. Well, what's a highway to heaven? Well, Jesus is the highway to heaven. But as you're following Jesus on the highway to heaven, very practically, very specifically, you're departing from evil. Your, your life is changing. He who keeps his way, you're going to stay in the way of Jesus. He's going to stay with you. Preserves his soul. Can I see 2 Timothy 2.21? 2 Timothy 2.21. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Do you see at the beginning of this? I mean, Paul's writing to Christians. Do you see in verse 21 what I just read? Therefore, if anyone, if any man, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself, pay attention to that. You say, no, I need Jesus to cleanse me. He did but you also cleanse yourself. In that context, there's vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. In that context, you want, to be a, you want to be the vessel of honor. You want to be the golden goblet. You want to be on the highway to heaven, departing from evil. So this is talking about what you're going to be like when you get to heaven. So what's it say? It says, flee also youthful lust. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself, He'll be a vessel of honor, a golden goblet, sanctified, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. There is something that we still do. We depart from evil. Are you tracking with me? He said, well, Jesus just saved me from everything. Well, he did. Did you depart from evil? Because that's part of the process. You don't get saved by departing from evil. You depart from evil because you are saved. Amen. You say, well, I'm still loving the evil. Well, then you're probably delusional about your salvation. Because if you're saved, something changes. You'll move from Meadow, Texas to come to Amarillo for Grace Church. <laughs> it's like, wh why? Why would you leave Knoxville, Tennessee? Did you know they have trees in Knoxville, Tennessee? I've been in Knoxville, Tennessee. They also have the biggest buckies up until we open up our buckies here. We beat Knoxville by 5,000 square feet, I think. So just so you know, I, I keep track of buckies. <laughs> but Zach didn't move here for the scenery. Right. <laughs> he didn't move here for the fishing. Right. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. If a man cleanses himself from these things. And if you're doing the math in your own life, in your own heart, you should look back and say, okay, I can kind of remember when I was 16. Oh, I do remember when I was 16. And I'm not that same guy. Matter of fact, I'm not the same guy I was 10 years ago. And hopefully I'm not the same guy I was a year ago. Because you're always departing from evil. You're always getting closer on the highway to heaven. Now, in case you're still on the highway to hell, you need Jesus. Well, no, I'll just come to church. That won't change anything. Except it'll, you need Jesus. Verse 18. <clears throat> Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. That's twice in the book of Proverbs. Pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Can I see James 4, 6? Real quick, James 4, 6. But he gives more grace. He gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace, more grace, like we're seeing in the book of Acts, great grace to the humble. Verse 20. He who heeds the word, he who listens to the word, he who obeys the word, He who heeds the word wisely will find good. Whoever trusts in the Lord 
Happy is he. I wonder how many of you woke up happy this morning. I didn't. Didn't. I had my reasons for not being happy, thank you. But wasn't happy. Maybe I'll just turn on Fox News and then I'll be happy. I know, I need to go find Cindy and then she'll make me happy. You know what Cindy would say? Get away from me. <laughs> there are some people, they're a very rare bird, they do wake up happy. But if you're like me, but if you learn that the only way you can get happy, you, you have to hang out with the Lord. Amen. I mean, it's, it's your Wednesday, and you say, no, I'll wait till we get to church Wednesday night. Well, I'm glad you're here. Hopefully you'll leave here more happy than when you came. But that word says happy. But then see, it's at the end of the verse. What it actually says, he who listens and obeys the word, heeds the word, wisely, we've been talking about, we'll find good. I want to find good. Whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. So if you're saved, you're on the highway to heaven, and you're reminded of that, and then you're looking in your Bible, and you're thinking, okay, I, I, I need a happy verse. Or maybe you just need a correcting verse. Whatever it might be that really happiness is when you, when you understand who you are in Christ, reminded of it afresh and anew, and you're like this morning, I was sitting in my living room, and okay, I, it was not raining yet, and it was still dark outside, and I have a Bible plan that I still stick to, and we're coming up on that. I would encourage you, <clears throat> and you do not have to read my Bible plan. You do not. You don't have to have my Bible. You do not. But you do need the Word of God, and then God's going to talk to you in His Word. He will. And it doesn't matter what plan you're on. It actually, in one sense, doesn't matter what part of the Bible you're in. The, the, the Word of God's a living book. My counsel would be what I've found. I love to read the Old Testament. It makes me hungry for the New Testament because the Old Testament can't solve the problem until I get to Jesus in the New. And when I get to Jesus in the New and you throw in a psalm and a prophet, I just... <clears throat> somewhere between that and reading through it and listening and then I'm a marker I'm a marker so I got all the colors I got and I have special Bibles just for reading I have special Bibles for preaching I have special I have multiple Bibles here I don't care how you do it just make sure you hear God and he knows how to encourage you correct you rebuke you love you gently or bop you over the head he knows how to do that so that, that was just me this morning. Then I, then I try to go back through what I've read, marked up and ever, and then I, and because I use the same reading Bible, this is the fifth year, I, I can also remind myself where I was five years ago and four years ago, prayer requests. I write all my prayer requests in my Bible. You do whatever you want, but I write them there because then I can look back and say, well, he died and she died, but he got healed and then they got saved and Zach moved to Amarillo. I'll read that next year. So reading this morning, this morning, it just struck, it just struck me because I'm thinking, okay, okay, okay. And I'm reading, I'm thinking, okay, okay. And, you know, I'm just not, it's okay if I tell you I'm not getting a buzz from the Lord. I'm just, I'm, 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 I got it, Lord, I got it, I got it, I got it. Is there something here? Something? Anything? And then we're in Revelation right now. Now, I don't know if Revelation blows your mind, but I always remember, hey, Revelation is like, that's where we're going. Do I understand all the details? I don't understand all the details. I just know it's like, boom. That's if you know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, it's like, boom, this way, you know, boom. You don't want that one. You want the, okay, so we're coming through the churches of Revelation, and finally, finally, we're called up to heaven, and we're seeing heaven 
in the future. John's there. And I read this in Revelation this morning. The four living creatures. Now, that's wild all by itself. Their faces and who they are. It's crazy. It's like, thank you. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, by the way, it's not holy, holy, holy. I just can't, I don't think it's that. I think it's like holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And they keep holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. By the way, God is eternal. And these four living creatures that we cannot even imagine, if one of them would show up here, we'd all fall like a dead man. Whenever the living creature gives glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. Can I see the next verse? The 24 elders. Now, if you study the book of Revelation, the 24 elders very well could represent the church. We're already in heaven, by the way. The 24 elders with these living creatures crying out, holy, holy, well, we fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns. That's where the title Casting Crowns comes from. And cast their crowns before the throne. And this is what we say. You are worthy, O Lord. You are worthy to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created Amen. now we've been talking and talking i've been every, i've been reminding you all the time we need to praise god more for his creative work it, it's what we'll do in heaven and so so many times we get like Okay, we know science, we know all this, we got it all figured out, you know, and then, yeah, okay, it's gonna be Christmas, we got it all, science. Listen, listen, don't ever, ever forget that God created you for his glory and that you can depart from evil and that you can cast your crown already before him and that's why you were created. Am I communicating? You say, why are you telling us that? It made me happy this morning. It made me happy I wasn't a frog that came out of a pond somewhere. It made me happy that I'm not an accident. I don't have to live like an accident. It actually made me happy that God actually, you know, designed me, created me, and for his glory, for his will, and he still, you know, he, all this other stuff that he created is for me to remember how much I'm an image bearer of his. Amen. Okay, I, I was happy with it this morning. You were happy. It made me think, okay, Lord, okay. As your created creature with the gospel that you have redeemed, I'll face another day for you. Okay. Well, I hope you all find your happy verse tomorrow. <laughs> A lot more I could say on that, but I have to go. I have to go. Here we go. Okay. Verse 20, verse 21. Uh, the wise in heart, the wise in heart will be called prudent, will be called wise. The sweetness of the lips increases learning. What? The sweetness of lips. It's not talking about your lipstick. It's not talking about ice cream on your lips. It's talking about well-spoken words. So the wise in heart will be called wise, prudent, and sweetness of lips. You're going to know the right thing to say at the right time. Increases learning. That, that's why even in sharing sermons or what you would share with people and stuff, if you, you want to make it eloquent and to where it's, it's good. You want to be honest, but you, wanna, you want it to be well-spoken words, the, the right word at the right time. Verse 22. 
Understanding is a wellspring of life to him who has it. Understanding, it's a wellspring of life to him who has it. But the correction of fools is folly. So if you're dealing with somebody that has understanding, it's like a wellspring of life. We, we can do it. But if you're dealing with a fool, to try to correct a fool, according to this verse, it's folly. Can I see Guzik has a great quote on that? Wisdom brings life. Wisdom brings life. But it is usually foolish. It's usually foolish to try to correct a fool. As soon as a fool decides to receive correction, which happens, they have started not being a fool and they leave their folly. Did that make sense? So if you're dealing with a fool that's still in his folly, he doesn't want you. It's just, it, it ain't going to work. You can use whatever you want to say. It ain't going to work. You do. But if a fool in his folly listens to the correction, then he's actually leaving his folly. So that would be worth it. You say, which one is it? You don't know until you try to correct him, and then you find out. Verse 23. The heart of the wise teachers, oh, excuse me, the heart of the wise teaches his mouth. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth. Can I hear you say mouth? Now, when I say that, why does it say the heart of the wise teaches his mouth? Well, because that's where all your words come. That's how you communicate. So the heart of the wise teaches his mouth. Adds learning to his lips. I, I changed that a little bit. I, I don't want to you know, mess with the word of God because of what that's saying is true. But I also want to add the heart of the wise teaches his fingers. We communicate a lot more with our fingers than we do with our words. The text you throw down, social media, what you throw down, emails you throw down. So I can add to that, the heart of the wise teaches his mouth. I, I need to teach my mouth, which basically try to keep your mouth shut. But I also have to teach my fingers and add learning to his lips. You need to add learning to your fingernails. Tracking with me? I just find it today so much. We will say things and communicate things. We would never communicate one-to-one. -one. We would never do it that way. So I want to be wise with my mouth and my fingers. Verse 24, pleasant words are like a honeycomb. You say, what's a honeycomb? Well, that was their payday bar back in the day. I don't know your favorite candy bar. Uh, Baby Ruth's really good, too. Uh, Baby Ruth, but I, I would still pick a payday over that. Personally, I got one in my dresser drawer. I do. I save it. I, it Cindy gave that to me like seven months ago or something. I don't know, but I save it. And I just, yes, yes. Pleasant words are like the right donut, like a honeycomb. Pity. Pleasant words, pleasant words, or texts, pleasant words. They're like candy bars. Sweetness to the soul, health to the bones. Pleasant words, pleasant words, are like honeycomb. Sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. Pleasant words, pleasant words. Where, where would you want that to be the most in your life? You might say, church. No, 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 no. There's something more important in church. Pleasant words. Like health to your body and your bones. You want pleasant words. You want the right words. The right words. It's your marriage. Yeah. Yeah. If we're just talking, you know, practically, it would be in your marriage that you would want to hear payday, baby Ruth. <laughs> yes. Right? Well, you get married, that's an automatic, right? Or if you're still in junior high, high school, and you've got friends, and it's just automatic, right? No, it's not. It's not automatic. Are you guys holding hands? If, if you are holding hands, are you holding hands? It's still not automatic, is it? It's not. Do you know why? Because we're so different. Whatever the world says, I'm telling you, they're wrong. According to the word of God, there are men and there are women. And we are different. A lot different. Let 
Matter of fact, in marriage, you want to hear the words that make you feel like a payday bar, a baby Ruth. And so I'm going to want to hear from Cindy whatever the words are that make me feel like I'm a blueberry donut. Like, yes! <laughs> and by the way, husbands, your wives who speak not a different language, but it's a different donut. It's a different candy bar. It's a, but it's, it's still pleasant words, right? You say, why are you going down this road? Because I actually, when I was studying this, I thought, you know, because where it is, I've got Cindy. You don't have Cindy. I have Cindy. She has me. You don't have me. But what, what words, you know, candy bar, blueberry donut, you know, chocolate milkshake, um, you know, I, that, that has to be happening. And the problem is, is that we're so different. That's why, can I see 1 Peter 3? 1 Peter 3. It actually, yeah, I get a hint here. This is talking about Sarah and wives. For in this manner, in former times, times, this Old Testament, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive. I know we don't like that word, but there it is. Being submissive to their own husbands. Okay, you're not submissive to men. You're submissive to your own husband. You get that, right? Every time I marry somebody, I said, no, okay, he's not your husband yet. He's about to be. If you don't want him, don't, don't say I do. But anyways, being submissive to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham. There's your example. That is the number one example in the New Testament from the Old Testament for every wife. Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Not one amen from any sister here. <laughs> Not one. Not one. Matter of fact, Peter's writing that to the church. That's New Testament. Your number one example is Sarah. And you say, well, what kind of donut did she throw to Abe? Lord. Now, if you'll notice, the word Lord is not capitalized. She didn't say, Lord Abraham. It's not that. It was Lord, little L. Do you, do you know what that, that means? Calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid of any terror. You're a daughter of Sarah. What, what was the word that really tripped the trigger for Abraham? The payday, the baby Ruth was Lord. You know what that word meant? What that meant? That word meant? It meant respect. Number one, it was a word of respect. But today it would sound like this. You're my man. You're my man. You're my man. You might be crazy, but you're still my man. I don't know where we're going, but you're my man. I want to go back to the malls and Amazon and, you know, life. We're going to live in a tent, but Abraham, you're my man. Did, did you know, ladies, basically that word, and it's more than just saying, you know. You know now, if you start calling them Mr. Gem, then something's, something's wrong here, you know. But, and Cindy knows how to communicate that. And she doesn't run around saying, you're my man, you're my man. I'm just saying, she knows how to communicate to me with the words where I know she respects me and I just got my blueberry donut. And it's health to our marriage, it's health to our bones. I'm going to skip what the men do and so let's go next. No, no, I'm not going to skip that. I am not. Okay, can I see 1 Peter 3, 7? So there's all this for women, basically... You're my man, you're my man, you're my Lord. If you get that down, that's 90% of it. But for husbands, husbands likewise dwell, live with them, your wife, with understanding. Can I hear you say understanding? By the way, you are commanded to understand your wife. She is not commanded to understand you. I'm, I'm speaking biblically here. Husbands, likewise, dwell. Live with your wife with understanding. That, that means you have to think about it. That means you have to actually think about it. You say, I got her all figured out. No, you don't. You might ever figure it out for an hour, but she changes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm not, she does. 
depending on the cycle of the month, she's different. <laughs> That's true. Depending what year of the marriage, what year of the marriage, she's different. And you say, when will she always be the same? Ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. So ladies, you know, it sounds, it sounds really like, oh man, I have to call him Lord and respect him and you're my man. That's easy. You might have a hard case for a husband, but at least you only got one thing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Here we go. The husband, biblically, to give your wife a payday bar, to give her what she really, really wants to hear. You have to think what kind of day she had. You have to think when you're walking in, where is she at? You have to think like, what's, what's plaguing my wife? What's honoring my wife? It actually means <laughs> you have to think about it. You dwell with her in an understanding way. You understand her. And all the cycles, all the problems, all the things, all the stuff... As to the weaker vessel, that doesn't mean cheaper. It means more fragile. She is. I don't know how that makes you feel. It should make you feel honored. But husbands, we can crush our wives that quick with one word. One word. And they just shatter. Now you got a really big mess, and it's your fault. All she wanted was a donut. All she wanted. <laughs> Understanding, giving honor, honor, honor to this, this very fragile vessel that you have as your wife. And as being heirs together, we, we are heirs together of the grace of God, that your prayers may not be hindered. Your prayer life runs on how you give the right candy, the right donut, the right honeycomb for healthy bones in your marriage. Which, by the way, mathematically means you have a problem that you need to know. Come on. Uh, the average man speaks 7,000 words a day. Come on. The average woman speaks... 20,000 <laughs> words a day. Which means when you get home from work, you probably used your 7,000. <laughs> <laughs> Which means your wife probably has 14,000 to go. Husbands, live with your wives, knowing they want to communicate with you. And there's a reason why we're made different. It's never boring. It's always challenging on both sides. But if you can figure out how to get in that flow of pleasant words, with your own children. I mean, if you have a donut-filled marriage, and I mean, at least we're, this is working, and you throw in your children. Fathers, you do not want to bark out orders to your children to cause them to wrath. You just don't. I got a text yesterday of one father that told his kids if they eat bacon it, he told his kids if they eat bacon they're going to go to hell no. you want to make sure the words you're using are pleasant words biblical words accurate words that build up healthy bones 
Amen. Amen. I'm not going to finish the chapter because I'm looking at the time, but isn't the word good? I mean, the word is good. Verse 25, I think that's okay. Verse 25, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of the way is, okay, death. Can I hear you say death? It's twice in the book of Proverbs, the same Proverbs. Uh, it, we'll see, uh, we saw it back in chapter 14, verse 12. Everybody thinks they're on the same, that they're on the right way. Everybody thinks they're on the right way. But the end thereof is the way of death. And so you have the self-righteous, religious, everybody's, oh, I'm reading my Bible, I'm trying to do what's right, and I go to church, and so it's self-righteous. It ends in death. You've got blatant sinners. Sinners are out there, and they just think, well, it doesn't matter anything. It ends in death. There's only one way, and that's the Lord Jesus. That's it. That's it. Everybody thinks you're in the right way. Leave me go. No, no. It's Jesus. Can I see trap on that? Trap says what now? And think not that this vain repetition, but know that it is thus redoubled, that it may be better remarked and remembered. Nothing is more ordinary or more dangerous than self-delusion. I think I'm okay. To warn us, therefore, of this greatest wickedness, to think you're in the right way. It is that this sentence is reiterated. You need to know Jesus. Everybody thinks they're on the right way. That ends in death. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Verse 26, the person who labors for himself. The person who labors, labors for himself. For his hungry mouth drives him on. That's actually a really good verse. You're hungry? Get a job. You want a donut? Go to work. You want a house? Get a job. No, I just want somebody to give it to me. Ah, uh, that doesn't work. It doesn't. That actually, I, I like what Morgan says about that. Morgan, can I see that? Uh, that is to say that hunger will make a man work when nothing else will. This is in harmony, harmony with the apostic, uh, apostic principle. If a man will not work, neither let him eat. Can I see walkie real quick? Walkie. The work is tiring and frustrating in this fallen world. Nevertheless, the drive to gratify his appetites prods the diligent person to productive efforts. God and the wise do not frustrate these primal productive drives and appetites by denying them gratification. In other words, you go to work, you'll get something. Or by gratifying them apart from work. So in other words, it's just really what the verse is actually trying to say. The person who labors, and you say, I don't want to labor. Well, the person who labors, labors for himself. For his hungry mouth drives him on. Can I say amen? If you have a job, amen. If you don't have a job, Uh, verse 27. Maybe I can. Oh, I can't do it. I don't think I can do it. An ungodly man digs up evil. You don't want to dig up evil. Evil's all, an ungodly man just digs it up. And it is on his lips like a burning fire. It would, it, stop it. Stop it. What does Clark say there? Clark says about that real quick. A wicked man labors as much to bring about an evil purpose as a quarryman does to dig up stones. Well, stop it. A perverse man sows strife. You don't want to sow strife. A whisperer separates the best of friends. Can I see Guzik? Twist it. Perverse people love to sow strife the way a farmer sows seeds. When there is much strife, there is some perverse person. Where there is much strife, there is some perverse person sowing the strife. Verse 29, a violent man entices his neighbor and leads him in the way that is not good. He winks his eye to devise perverse things. He purses his lip, compresses his lips, and brings about evil. Um, I was trying to think about that. By the way, you're supposed to love your neighbor. But if you got a neighbor, like I, I was actually thinking about it in junior high and high school. And that's when you start seeing all this, you know, people trying to push evil on you and you know, all this kind of mindless stuff. And, and I guess it happens at work and everything else. I've been blessed to work in the church for most of my life. Um, that verse doesn't happen a lot in church. It does happen sometimes. But anyways, you don't want to mess with a violent man. You just don't. What do I do with my neighbor? Well, you try to love him. Try to love him. But don't join this club. Uh, verse 30, 31. The silver-haired head... 
The silver-haired head is a crown of glory if it is found in the way of righteousness. Amen. Can hear an amen. And we're going to end with this last verse. Da, 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 da. Oh, I said it too early. He was slow to anger. He is slow to anger. Can I hear slow to anger? Is better than the mighty. You want to, the mighty, if you're slow to anger. And he who rules his spirit, you rule your spirit. Then he who takes the city, actually the one who can rule his spirit, slow to anger, is better than his big old mighty armor or somebody who takes the city. Can I see James 119? James, you know this verse. So then, my beloved, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Slow to wrath. Slow to wrath. By the way, Jesus is slow to wrath. But he is a God of wrath. He's just slow. He said, I just want to blow up. Make a whip. You know what happens when you make a whip? When Jesus made a whip, it's like counting the ten. Slow to wrath. Verse 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. And this was the way they determined in the Old Testament how to find God's will. The lot is cast into the lap. That's not like just throwing dice. That's not like, well, every time the dice is thrown. No, when you're actually trying to find God's will, when that lot is cast, its every decision is from the Lord. Can I see Kidner uh, real quick? The Old Testament uses the word lot, shows that this proverb is not about God's control of all the random occurrences, but about his setting of matters properly referred to him. He knows how to guide his people. The last time you see a lot cast in your Bible is in the Acts, is it Acts 116? Acts 116, or 126, Acts 126. And they cast their lots and it fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the 11 apostles. And so when they were replacing Judas, we saw it in the book of Acts, they actually, well, they had a couple guys, which one, and they cast the lot. They wanted to know God's will. It fell on Matthias. That's the last time you see the lot cast in your Bible. You say, well, I can't figure out God's will. Well, you can flip a coin. 50-50, but you know what's better than flipping a coin? And God can control your coin. Well, I'll just see if my phone rings. You know what's better than seeing if your phone rings? I mean, God can do that too. You have a Bible. You have the Lord Jesus. You have the Holy Spirit. You have prayer. You have Jesus that knows how to open doors and closes doors. You have a church. You have time. You can lay it before the Lord. You don't have to cast the dice. You don't have to flip a quarter. Lord, what do you want me to do? And then you wait. And then in the will of God, he's going to say, Amarillo by morning. <laughs> Amarillo by morning. Amarillo by morning. Huh. When do I get out of here, God? He hasn't told me that yet. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for my friends that showed up. And thank you that we can heed whatever section or whatever word that we covered tonight. I pray, Lord, that we could obey what you want us to obey. Help me with sweeter words with my Cindy and my children and my church, I pray. Bless, bless my friends, Lord. We thank you for Jesus and that we're on the highway to heaven. Thank you. Thank you. Come quickly, Lord Jesus.